Good morning, everyone. Wang Wenzhe, and warm welcome to the panel Indigenous Languages and the Arctic Policies, Practices, and Challenges, organized by the Guichin Tribal Council and the Vigdis International Center for Multilingualism and Intercultural Understanding. My name is Sofia Zachova. I'm researcher at the Vigdis Fimbodotter Institute for Foreign Languages and Iceland's representative in the Global Task Force of the International Decade of Indigenous Languages. We have invited distinguished speakers representing indigenous communities to discuss language rights, institutional approaches, grassroots practices, and main challenges in preserving, maintaining, and revitalizing indigenous languages. I very much look forward to hearing your valuable insights and discussing prospects for the indigenous languages in the Arctic. Now, I would like to ask our panelists to introduce themselves. Wenzi Shalaknat, Shirit Kaniki Kavichik Vilji, Kuchin Tribal Council Angit, E. Shit Sit Shit Ehli, Naarit Ellen Smith Vaji, Shitsi Shitsu Kaha Peter Tsat Mary Keha, Kova Shi In Li, Inuvik Akotsat, Teleje Kujit, Dika Shakathat, Northwest Territories Canada Kujitan, Chukrin Lo Rit, Yenjit Kuchileha, no gwitsakinihi ako tsat, sha kuchin nat. Go ve van jut ako de chinu. Good morning. And what I just said in our Dinjiju language is my name is Kenny Kikovicic, and I am the Grand Chief of the Kuchin Tribal Council. My mother is Alan Smith, and my grandparents are Peter and Mary Kay, and I grew up in Inuvik and Fort McPherson in the Northwest Territories of Canada. It is my honor to be here to speak with you all. And it is great, with great humility and respect that I, respect, I represent the Quichin here today. Established in 1992, the Quichin Tribal Council, or GTC for short, is an indigenous organization that represents over 35 participants to the Quichin Comprehensive Land Claim Agreement who originate from the Northwest Territories in the communities of Aklavik, Inuvik, Tedleje, known as Fort McPherson, and Tsigichik. The Quichin are a culturally independent nation that is focused on protecting and advancing our interests. Through quality work, collaborative approaches, and good governance, we strive to increase economic opportunities, develop quality infrastructure, promote health and wellness, and preserve the culture and language of the Quichin. In addition to Michelle Wright, who joins me on the panel here today, I am also pleased to introduce other members of our team from the Quichin Tribal Council that, that are in attendance. I would like to introduce Jamie Cooey, who is our Chief Operating Officer and one of our Quichin participants. Nolan Rainville, our Program Coordinator with our Lands and Resources team. Nolan hails from the Missanabe Cree First Nation, a First Nation under Treaty 9, located in Northern Ontario. And finally, Tara Kikovicic, our Executive Assistant, and another of our Quichin participant employees, who also happens to be my wife of over 18 years. Masi. Come on, um, St. Jackson Lafferty, say, yeah. Grand Chief, Tension Governments, okay. Gia Grand Chief, we don't. So, the next one is in the Masi, the phone there. The Zoho, you know, Quanta Lani. And you know, I used to listen to the the First of all, I just want to say uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, such an honor to be here. And um, just want to say uh, my name is Jackson Lafferty. I'm a Tlinchon Grand Chief uh, for uh, Northwest Territories, Northern Canada. 
and uh, I guess Ken and I are our neighbors, the Guqin and the Tlinchuang. There's a lot of uh, col collaboration, uh, cooperation uh, uh, that we work together on uh, when it comes to the language, the overall language revitalization. I come from a small community of uh, Beshakon, and um, we, I, I um, represent four communities. Our, uh, our uniqueness is that uh, uh, we have our own self-governing and our constitution with Canada, government of the Northwest Territories, and our Tlinchon government. We've been uh, operating since uh, 2005, uh, starting the implementation. So it's been uh, well over um, 17, 18 years now. And the language has always been the forefront of our discussion. Uh, the assembly that uh, we conduct in our language. Uh, we have a new converse as well. We have, a, for the first time, we have two female chiefs from our community. It's always been a male dominated, but uh, we're making headways, we're making progress, and we're very proud of our two female chiefs from the most isolated communities, Gamati and Wikwiti. Uh, such an honor to, to be part of them, uh, the discussions that we have. Uh, so with this, uh, the whole process of uh, language revitalization works in all walks of life. and. Um, with our central operations at the community level and even with our elders. And um, I'm one of the, the lucky ones that um, still continue to speak my language fluently in the Tlinchon language. Uh, I've gone to um, a residential school in the past, and, but uh, it was through my parents and my grandparents that kept my language. And every time I came home, they spoke the Tlinchon language to me. And this, um, this uh, land art that my, my daughter made for me is uh, symbolic of uh, every child matters. And uh, so it has a reflection in our, in our history. So we just carry that message forward that it truly happened and that we have to reconcile um, both uh, at the federal level, territorial, and also at the, at the grassroots level, central government. But I'm very much looking forward to our discussion on uh, what we've been working on, where we're at, and going forward. So with that, I just want to say masicho. Yeah, um, my name is Kivyok Lustam, uh, in Uwayok. Kalar na ninga nagpunga, kalar sa kalutot lunga. Kisyad ni. Very shortly, so that we can continue. My name is, as I said, Rivier Lustram. I lost my language uh, at a young age because of our education system and could not speak Greenlandic properly when I moved north. Uh, to the northern part of Greenland when I was 11 years old. And the language debate is so intense in Greenland that at that point I was told to commit suicide because I was not a real Greenlandic person and I did not deserve to live. And that uh, was by several girls my own age, 11-year-old girls, telling me to do that. When I went to a teacher, and said, they say that I'm not a real Greenlandic person because I cannot speak Greenlandic. He just looked at me and said, but it's true. So we have a lot of trauma when it comes to language in Greenland as well. Uh, we still have an ongoing debate about language use and quote unquote, who is a real Greenlandic person based on language sometimes. Um, we have had a home rule government since 1979. And in 2009, we got uh, our own self-government uh, act uh, set in place, where the official language of Greenland, Greenland became Gadaldisut. Um, what we tend to forget as a collective in Greenland, though, is that we have several dialects, but we also have uh, so strong variations in language that we do some consider uh, the language uh, in East Greenland 
Iviorasi as their own language, and Inuktitut is spoken in North Greenland, and that is not being acknowledged by our own Nalekersusut, our government. So we also internally have our own systems that uh, oppress and suppress languages, uh, even though we ourselves are indigenous peoples. So uh, I will get more into how it, the whole system is in Greenland, but I will give the word to our next speaker. Jen Quincy, Shurjit Crystal, Frank Audrey, Vashrank Ogwitz Anishi, Nets Aikwich Anishi, Deacon Chick Aki, Hyakwik Aquitai, Deacon Chick Wantai Nali. My name is Crystal Frank. Um, my Gwich in name is Tsekak. I'm Nets Aikwich in from Arctic Village, Alaska. And it has a population of about 146 people. It's in northeastern Alaska, below the Brooks Range. I'm currently a, the tribal administrator for the Arctic Village Council, and also a PhD student in the Indigenous Studies program at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I'm a translator and transcriber, and I'm also a language learner. Our language is still alive in my community and other places in the Yukon Flats and in North um, Western Canada. Um, it has, our language has a spirit and it's so important for us as the younger generation to wake up that spirit and to continue to keep our language strong and moving forward because it's our way of having a connection to our way of life as a people. Um, and I, I like to thank you for inviting me to speak here. Um, this is such a formal space for Gwich'in people because we like to stand up and hold the mic and hold our staff and, you know, that's how, that's how we talk. But sitting up here in front of this bright light is very intimidating. <laughs> but thank you, Masicho. During Gwinsi, Shuri Michelle Wright, Shayawan Kat the Shahan Mary McRae Vaji, Sat Shit E. Mike Hardwell Vaji, Guvietzi Dichu, Nita Gwitsat Gwich in Ihli. I work with the Gwich'in Tribal Council in the Nivik Northwest Territories, Canada. My background is in teaching. Earlier this year, I started at the Gwich'in Tribal Council as the manager of early learning and language. I'm honored to be in this position where I can serve my people, and I am happy to be here with you today. Masi. Thank you, dear panelists. As we have heard, from the introductory notes of the panelists, uh, in the Arctic, the way of life of indigenous communities, including the language, has been threatened and oppressed. At the same time, we heard notes about the growing and inspiring movement among the indigenous communities in the region to reclaim their language. Despite the, historical, the histories of language oppression and the current endangered status of indigenous languages, some see growing number of speakers and learners. Like, likewise, grassroots initiatives led by indigenous peoples that revitalize their languages and maintain their cultural heritage are on the rise in some communities, and I look forward to hear more about these initiatives. Some initiatives have been supported and facilitated by policies at governmental and local level but still we know that many are being developed in the context of challenges and issues that need to be addressed. One global initiative that has emerged as a result of the inspiring endeavors and advocacy work of indigenous peoples to reclaim and nourish their languages is the United Nations International Decade of Indigenous Languages 2022-2032. 
the decade has the ambitious aim to safeguard, revitalize, and preserve indigenous languages and improve the lives of the communities that speak them. As the national promoter of the decade and as a category two UNESCO institution, the Vigdis International Center committed itself to be a platform for dialogue and collaborative action. The Arctic Circle Assembly is one of the forums in the context of which we launched such conversations since last year, 2022. With this panel, we aim at bringing together indigenous communities leaders and experts to discuss the realities, perspectives, and multifaceted measures needed to support indigenous languages. We will try to further continue the dialogue and communicate the major points through the global network of the international decade. We are very grateful to the Gwich'in Tribal Council for the fruitful collaboration in hosting and shaping the panel so that we can now le learn more about the involvement of Gwich'in leadership and organizations in language work. I would like to especially thank the planning and support committee members, um, Devlin Fernandez, Gwich'in Council International, Tara Kukovicic from the Gwich'in Tribal Council, and uh, especially Charles Sanders from the Government of Northwest Territories, who unfortunately cannot be with us today. Uh, we look forward also to hear the pr perspectives from another community of speakers in the Canadian Northwest, as we heard, represented by Grand Chief Jackson Lauferty, as well as reflections from Greenland, where despite the fact that an indigenous language has an official status, there are still many challenges that need to be addressed as already mentioned. With no further ado, I would like to now invite each of our panelists to come here for their introductory remarks of three minutes. Thank you. Masi Sophia, it's an honor to be here. Did a really good job with Kikovicic, by the way. <laughs> I was checking in the hotel on our way over in Vancouver. And when you check into the hotel, you first give them your last name. And I said, Kikovicic. And they said, uh, Brandon? I said, no, <laughs> it's actually Ken. And the guy at the front desk said, well, that's not a very common last name, so it's interesting that there be two of you on this reservation. In our Gwich'in language, Kikovicic means, can I carry the arrow? And I have an ancestor that grew up as a young boy asking hunters in our community, can I carry the arrow? He wanted so desperately to hunt, but he was not yet old enough to be able to harvest due to the protocol that we had. And so what he would do is he'd carry the arrow to the threshold to the point where he could go, and he'd give the arrows to the hunters. And so the, the old timers called him Kikovicic, and that young boy grew up to be a leader. And I and Brandon are one of his descendants. So when we were at the hotel, I asked the front desk attendant, I said, could you do me a favor? He said, what? I said, when Brandon does check in, can you just tell him, can I carry the arrow? <laughs> needless to say, I got a, Brandon's in the crowd here, needless to say, I got a call later that night. I think he thought the CIA was involved and somehow <laughs> covertly found out about him being there. But I think, you know, I was really pleased to hear everybody introduce themselves in their indigenous language because it's so important that we introduce ourselves in this manner. It speaks to who we, are, who we are and where we come from. Essential building blocks for understanding between individuals. I myself am still learning our language and I'm, and I'm not fluent in our Dinjiju language. My introduction, though, however, is a starting point in my journey towards reclaiming my language and comprehension. Thankfully, there are a number of residential school survivors in our communities that many of whom were forbidden to speak their language in their early formative years that are now our language keepers in our communities. And in preparing for this panel, I was struck at the thought of recent losses we have had in our community and region over the last few years. We now have elders who do not have anyone to speak the language with. 
whether they are losing their spouses, family members, or friends passing on, there are no longer these individuals to converse with, perhaps share a good story, a heartwarming laugh, or maybe even a little bit of gossip. We seemingly lose an elder at least every two to three months. Knowledge and language keepers who leave the remaining living, and as we call them, walking and breathing encyclopedias, to wonder who they can converse with. We view English as a limited language. Our Gwich'in language, or as we call it, our Dinji Zhu language, is complex and can have many differing meanings depending upon context, structure, and accentuation, amongst other things. I guess it could be characterized as a difference between 2D and 3D to those in the technical fields from our perspective. Think of the myriad of new words that are required to evolve with the changing world we now find ourselves in. Consider how knowledge keepers would be able to come up with words for modern terms such as internet, software, and applications such as Snapchat, Twitter, and Facebook. Often a group of these knowledge and language keepers would gather and brainstorm ideas of potential words and agree upon a particular word or structure to help our language evolve. This unfortunately is seemingly disappearing with the passage of time and the pas passage of our precious elders. Therefore, at the GTC, our efforts have been focused on bringing our remaining language keepers together. Michelle Wright, who is our manager of early learning and language for the GTC, will be able to share some of these details in a, in a little bit here. However, her programming has been focused on the publications of small stories in our language, audio and video archives, and mentor apprentice forums to provide the knowledge transfer to a younger generation. Furthermore, we have begun looking at applications, one that we call Kaikit, that will bring our language awareness and understanding to smartphones and tablet computers. We also focus on the sharing of knowledge across our Gwich'in nation, and I'm pleased to share the stage here with Crystal Frank of Arctic Village, and I traveled here, as I mentioned earlier, with my cousin Brandon Kikovicic from the Van Tut Gwich'in of Old Crow. We learn from ed educators like Brandon and Crystal that we need to have a broad-based approach on language that focuses on preservation and revitalization separately, along with other elements such as curriculum development. Central to all of this is the longer-term goal of teaching in a land-based environment. As Gwich'in, we are proud of the spiritual relationship that we hold with the land, air, natural resources such as Vadzai, which in English is caribou, and water. When combined with our language, that is a powerful combination that has sustained and established our sovereignty for our nation for a millennia. I'm pleased to also share the stage with my good friend, Clichon Chief Jackson, Grand Chief Jackson Lafferty. In many ways, our Quichon nation strives to emulate what the Clichon have been able to develop in their territory to the south of us near the city of Yellowknife, which is the capital of the Northwest Territories of Canada. In Clichon country, Young people fluently speaking their language and their Klichong government, using their mother tongue as the primary method of verbal and written communication in their legislative body of governance. We share those same goals for our future Dinji Zhu government in the Mackenzie Delta region of the Northwest Territories and Peel Watershed of the Yukon that we are negotiating at the current time. I look forward to our discussion this morning and fielding any questions that you may have. In closing, I would like to sit, extend a heartfelt thanks, which we say in Gwich'in, hi, to all of you for your interest in the challenges and opportunities we face in the preservation and revitalization of our Indigenous languages. Maxi, Grand Chief Ken Kikovicic. Now, I would like to invite Grand Chief Jackson Lauferty for his opening remarks. Merci. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say um, uh, occasions like this, uh, obviously you wear a traditional attire, 
but uh, my traditional vest is still on the way. I lost my baggage. <laughs> Hopefully I'll arrive before we leave here. Um, I just want to, uh, um, I know Sophia, we have three minutes, but uh, to speak my language, uh, it's a must. And uh, Klinchon language is the first language for me, and uh, English language is second language. I didn't even speak a word of English when I was growing up, so I think out of respect for my family and my ancestors that I speak my language first. Immersion programs, it's on Tani, I get to mentorship, apprenticeship, apprenticeship, it's on the school, and the school, not the quality, it's on literacy, it's a day, Danny Nick, it's on K, I get to go into the government, it's only Danny, such a lot of da, such a deal, the great tida, such a deal, the what's a Danny, the great tida, Nakota, in the, 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 the knock, eh, what's on Sabak A with us in one day? The knock, eh, what's that? That's on D, they get what's that day, then they do how twenty Goyati on Dagi here. That's on T, what's that done in the Goyati, the knock, eh, go out on there. First of all, I'd just like to say um, it's truly an honor to be here to speak on the overall language. And um, Ken uh, alluded to about. Um, losing our traditional uh, knowledge keepers and um, all the experience that we're losing rapidly, in, even in our, in our region as well. And uh, we lost so many elders uh, over the years, and even just recent as well. I lost one of my, my, my best buddy uh, from Wati, one of the small community, and he was 85 or 86 years old. And uh, I'm not even close to his, his age, but he called me my best friend every time I saw him. And we just lost him uh, a couple years ago, and it's been a very difficult process because he has tons of stories to tell. But we are working on how we can revive our history, the stories that have been shared with, uh, from the elders. Coming from Northwest Territories, similar to Ken, Kenny here, um, Northwest Territories is uh, 40,000 population. 50% is uh, indigenous language speakers. Uh, gov government and Northwest Territories have 11 official languages. Nine of, uh, of them are indigenous Aboriginal languages, which is recognized uh, by uh, government and Northwest Territories. So one of them is Klinchon language, which I will speak to. So over 50% of our Klinchon population is fluent in their language. But like similar to um, uh, Kenny's writing and, and, and other jurisdictions as well, we are also uh, on decline, especially with a younger, younger generation. Uh, we went from 2,700 to 2,200 fluent speakers within five years. That is a scary number. So what can we do? What, what have we been working on? So one of, part of the existing programs that we currently deliver in our region is uh, one of the immersion programs, how we can best deliver Klinchon language into schools, JK to grade one. There's also a mentor apprentice program, which I also took uh, with my daughter um, I, was, uh, I was part of government in Northwest Territories. I was Minister of Education for eight years, and part of that was official language. I was in charge of official language. So being with government in Northwest Territories for 16 years, and um, uh, I was hardly at home. My kids grew up. I have five kids, and they grew up without knowing the Klinchon language. Uh, but they're starting to learn now. So my daughter wants to take this program, so I said, sure, let's do it. 
And uh, it was great ex experience for me and her too. Just getting to know my daughter. And um, so it was quite an adventure. Um, so that's a mentor apprenticeship program that uh, we introduce parents and adults take pro programs. And adult learning classes also is well attended, even from uh, non clinical members want to learn clinical language. Uh, literacy classes as well uh, help citizens to read and write in our language. Uh, language is mostly oral until um, 1990s when we started documenting everything. So clinical language uh, uh, operates bilingually. Uh, we as a clinical government, we have an assembly, annual assembly, regional assemblies that's conducted in clinical language. We want to have a fully immersed uh, language, but there's some few speakers that are still learning the, the process, but they are uh, learning fast to speak their language in assembly. So that exempl ex exemplifies as leaders on the importance of our language. So as a government, because of uh, level of fluency and rate of uh, our language decline, have the responsibilities to both operate and also offer, offer services in our language and also invest. When we talk to federal government, we talk about investment and uh, we're not uh, asking for handouts. We're not asking for you know, millions of dollars. Of course, it would be nice to have that, but at the same time, it's investing into our people, investing into our language. I think that's just uh, the wording uh, makes a big difference in order to protect and promote our languages. So offering services uh, versus revitalization of programs requires completely different approaches, supports, and also the resources. And Ken touched on the, on the land program, which we have been successfully delivering as well with the elders, and uh, predominantly speaking clinical language in a tent uh, format, whether it be in a boat, uh, hunting, uh, and so forth. It's all spoken in clinical language. And there's been uh, recipients of the past continue on to second, third, or fourth programming because they wanna learn more of a basic clinical language. And it's great to see. And uh, so with that, I just wanna say thank you for this, this opportunity and very much looking forward to talking about um, how we were involving technology and so forth uh, uh, as we move further along. Masicho. Masicho, thank you. Grand Chief Jackson Lofferty. And now I would like to invite Kiviok, Kiviok Lofstrom for her opening remarks. Yeah. Well, as you might have heard, I now speak fluent Greenlandic, which I'm pretty proud of. <laughs> yeah. um, but I wanted to get right into it because this is a long history of a difference between our brethren, or as we like to say, with those we share roots with. Uh, on the other side of the, the waters. And that is that when we were colonized, our cultural practices were stopped. Our songs, uh, our dances, and so forth. But our language uh, was kept because it served the purposes of our colonizers. So we very early on got our language in, in, as a written language already in the 1700s, late 1700s, and we, have one of the oldest currently running newspapers in the world, which was also the very first colored newspaper in the world. So this was run in Galashisut, Greenlandic, and uh, uh, we have a tradition of being very proud of our language. Uh, so we have always been very strong representatives at the Inuit Circumpolar Council from Greenland. And uh, one of those people uh, was uh, Carl Christian Olsen Buyu, who 
just recently got the, gave, I like to say, our university the honor of being an honorary doctor uh, at our place. And he fought for us to get our own language secretariat. Um, but also that we have uh, our own uh, language council and a Greenland place names committee so that every place that is being mapped will get a name in Greenlandic, in Galatlisut. And that is very important because, again, it is our land, it is our waters. Um, so uh, we have, uh, uh, as a consequence of our colonization, uh, the authority language in Greenland is very often Danish. And so what you're being taught in school is often written in Danish and written by Danes or a Danish point of view, which of course have an impact on how we, the Inuit, view ourselves and how uh, it can also affect our pride and our love for our culture and each other. So it's a huge impact that it has been written by Danes. So I'm very pleased to say that we are in the middle of rewriting our history from a Greenlandic point of view, basically decolonizing history and ensuring that the history that is more nuanced is being showcased, not only to Galatlit, but to the rest of the world. Uh, we have also uh, our own uh, television network, which is uh, now over 40 years old, they just had the anniversary. And it is also run in Galatlisut. Uh, and I can find from the 90s they actually included uh, interviews and so forth in the languages spoken both in the North and the East. Nowadays, uh, they don't really do that. They often put subtitles on or treat it as something that is too foreign to be Galatlisut. Um, but um, this uh, use of Danish as an authority language, despite the fact that our 2009 government law uh, states that we have to use Greenlandic as our uh, um, official language, uh, is very expensive because we have to use millions of Danish kroners every year to translate from Danish to Greenlandic or vice versa. Uh, and also the law when it is written in Greenland, it's the Greenlandic version that you have to use. So if someone translated it wrong, we have had an instance where the Danish version was the one that people assume was the correct version but it had been mistranslated to Greenlandic, so the law was actually the opposite of what it was supposed to be. And nobody realized for some years until a Greenlandic uh, speaking and reading politician read it and said, uh, hold on, wait a minute. So we have these uh, things that could happen. But Okasilarific was established in uh, October 26, 1999, uh, 1989, so almost uh, their anniversary uh, in a few days. Uh, uh, and we, we have fought really hard to get this. So we have, as a status for right now, the agreement of the Finance Act for 2013 um, uh, on page 15. It says that they have prioritized for further development in the language area. And here they are focusing on promoting increased digitalization of the translation work, prioritizing work with the use of technical terms and promoting terminology development, as well as continuing the work of attaching place names to digital maps. So it, it showcases how important it is for the government as well that we use Gadaitlisut. Uh, and the reason why it's so important that we have uh, terminology developed is because we have uh, a language that hasn't been furthered in many years, actually. We haven't developed terminology for colonization besides the original one, which only means, if you translate it directly, uh, to taking over someone's land. So uh, 
you cannot talk about uh, the mental colonization or other kinds of colonizations in Greenlandic because it makes no sense because you have to include the uh, to be a land that has been overtaken or colonized. So we need to create terminology not only in that, but also in basic human rights terms. We do not have the proper uh, terminology that people use. And uh, this has created a huge problem because as you can see, hopefully, we're quite bright in Greenland. And uh, when it, we speak our own language at the Danish parliament, and it's being translated by a translator to Danish from Greenlandic, because we, when we speak Greenlandic, don't use uh, terminology that, uh, that is technical, but it, when we speak our language, it's understandable and makes sense and it's professional, but when it's directly translated to Danish, it sounds like we don't know what we're talking about. It's, it sounds like we're trying to describe something. We're not quite sure what it is. And that actually uh, keeps uh, the myth in Denmark alive that we do not know what we're doing, that our politicians are just playing around and that nobody sh is really that respectable anyway. And so we need this terminology so that when our speeches are being translated to Danish, it's being done in a professional manner and ensuring that our dignity is intact as well. And not only Danish, but English as well, of course. And, and uh, that's why I'm very happy that they're using their money on this. Personally, on another level, uh, as a university uh, lecturer, um, I took a lot of uh, inspiration from Aluki, uh, Kotiak, who is a wonderful woman, uh, also uh, someone I share roots with. <laughs> and uh, she said in 2022 at the United Nations, for Arctic indigenous communities, language is critical to political, economic, social, cultural, and spiritual rights. In fact, every time an indigenous person utters a word in indigenous language, it is an act of self-determination. And I couldn't agree more, which is why, in order to ensure that my students could do that, I taught in Galatlisut. And of course, all of our materials are in English or Danish, because that's what we have. We can't translate everything to Galatlisut at the moment. So it, it was a, an exercise in translanguaging. But when I taught in Galatlisut, uh, and used it as my main language. Of course, I had some Greenlandic uh, students who are Danish speaking, who just like me had lost their language, but unlike me had not re relearned it. So what I would do was I would have my PowerPoint in Danish or English, depending on what we had read. And that would work kind of as a subtitle for what I was saying in Galatlisut. And whenever I added something to the discussion or someone had said something fantastic from my students, I would repeat it in Danish. So it, it was a good way for all of us to recognize the, the technical terms as well. But what this ended up with is that there was a noticeable better understanding of the material. There was an improved motivation amongst my students. Uh, there was a higher attendance rate uh, when you compare it to the other lectures that they would have to go to. They had higher grades than ever before. And also, there was a greater sense of community amongst the students, which I find as one of the most important things. So in conclusion, being able to teach in our own language means so much more than uh, what you think. It has a huge impact later on as well uh, uh, in society. Thank you. Kuyanak Kivok for sharing the experiences from Greenland. Now we are moving back again to Witchen. And I would like to invite Crystal Frank for her opening remarks.
Jim Guinzi. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to share a little bit about my language learning. Um, I, I love how my language allows me to have a, a whole different worldview. Um, it helps me to have a deeper understanding of my way of life and my identity as a Gwich'in woman. Um, when I was a child, my father used to make me uh, read in Gwich'in for about 30 minutes a day. And I wanted to play outside, but he'd always make me sit on the couch. Um, and I'm very grateful that he did that because I was able to learn how to read in my language. Um, I'm, I learned very quickly that, um, that reading my language can be done. I, um, both my parents are fluent speakers. I grew up hearing my language every single day. And for about eight years, we didn't have electricity in my cabin. So I was able to pick up my, my learning in my language. I don't understand, I don't consider myself as a fluent speaker, but I can understand fluently um, and I can read and write in my language. A few years ago, I, I worked on a project called the Caribou Project, and I was hired as a translator and a transcriber for a book called Dinjivitsaith um, that means The Man Who Became a Caribou by um, Craig Mischler and by my father, Kenneth Frank. It's based on a series of oral interviews from elders in rural Northeast Alaska and Yukon Territory. It talks about the traditional harvesting and use of caribou, traditional beliefs and taboos about caribou. During this project, I realized that I didn't know a lot of words that pertains to hunting and harvesting because I didn't go out hunting as a child due to taboos and beliefs of girls not allowed to be out where hunters are. So I was able to, so during the project, I was able to learn new nouns and I continued to transcribe and translate and it became easier and easier over, over time and my Gwich'in spelling improved tremendously. So during this project, I, I spent many nights um, at the University of Alaska Fairbanks campus after working eight-hour days and into the late evenings. I would be listening to stories. I felt that I got to spend this time with my grandmothers and my grandfathers that have passed on. I imagine being in my great-grandfather Johnny Frank's cabin. Warm wood stove, the smell of tobacco pipe from my grandfather, and grandma making bannock at the, in, the, in the wood stove, and caribou meat sizzling on the fire. This is what I imagined. We often say that our ancestors are with us in spirit. While transcribing, I felt that that, that is where I was. I felt that I was sitting next to them and listening to their stories. We have this connection to our ancestors through stories, and we have a connection to caribou and the land. Our elders tell us if we go back to the land, it will teach us. That is where we will learn our language. My generation is trying so hard to, to make our language stronger. It makes us happy when we speak our language. We laugh and we tease each other in our language. We have to constantly remind speakers to speak to us in our language, and we remind each other to, to keep practicing. We support each other in our language learning, and 
I recently moved back home to my community and I'm around my language every single day and I try to speak my language as much as possible and, and we have to constantly <laughs> remind each other and it, it's such a blessing to have that it's such a blessing to still have our language like that that's alive and and people are speaking it and we still have elders that were once when they were children were nomadic and and having our language is um, it's a part of us and a part of our identity so learning my language has been um, healing in many ways it gives me a connection to the past and to my elders our elders tell us stories of when they were no, of a time when our people were nomadic, when animals used to talk, um, or our history, and when they live off the land and they traveled place to place. It's healing because we are still here. We still have our language, and they can't and it can't be taken away from us. It gives us such a strong foundation as a people, and it connects and it connects us to our way of life as Gwich'in. Masi Cho. Masi Cho. Thank you, Christo. Thank you very much. Now, our last panelist, Michelle Wright. Please. Thank you. I will be sitting down. That's okay. I'm yes. going to use an excuse that I have crutches, but really it's just because I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> like many other indigenous languages in Canada, Dinjiju Ginjik, the Gwich'in language, is in threat of going extinct. But as Crystal said, our language is still alive. Most of our speakers are older adults and elders, and as Grand Chief Ken mentioned, we are losing them. Not only are we in danger of losing the language, but we are also in danger of losing the traditional knowledge and skills passed down for generations with which our language is intertwined. This is significant because of the potential that language, culture, and intergenerational connection hold for healing, growth, and nation building. Grand Chief Ken mentioned some of the programming that is happening. We launched our Kaikit language learning app available for download. We created a few children's books written in Dinji Zhu Ginjik. We have Gwich'in participants involved with a mentor apprenticeship program where pairs meet to speak and learn our language. And we have a Gwich'in language nest in Inuvik a uh, language-based immersion program for three and four-year-olds, and it is led by a Gwich'in elder speaker of Dinjiju Ginjik and a language learner. Preserving and re revitalizing Dinjiju Ginjik for future generations is the focus of our department. And as an act of preservation and revitalization, and to inform the work ahead, the language department hosted a Gwich'in language gathering over three days in April. It was called Indo Treda, or Moving Forward. We celebrated and considered the past, the present, and the future of Dinjiju Ginjik. About 60 people attended the language gathering from communities of the Gwich'in settlement area, and we were also joined by Gwich'in participants from across Canada. The Gwich'in participants that attended ranged from fluent speakers to very beginners, and we heard their concerns and experiences with the language, giving direction to the language department. For those living away from Gwich'in community, the language gathering afforded opportunity to reconnect with family and give voice to their own challenges and solutions to learning Dinjiju Ginjik away from home. By hosting the language gathering, we were able to bring fluent speakers together with one another. It was so evident how much language means to them, and that though time gets shorter, there remains a deep reservoir of wisdom, optimism, and enthusiasm among elders and knowledge holders. 
Uh, while we do have challenges that limit how quickly the Gwich'in Tribal Council can move forward revitalizing Dinji Zhu Ginjik, I am hopeful that we can revitalize our language. Masi. Merci, Michelle. Thank you for providing uh, this uh, short presentation of a rich experience. Um, I'm afraid we don't have a lot of uh, time for, uh, for discussion or uh, questions from, uh, from the audience, uh, but I would like to um, ask the pan panelists to reflect on digital technologies and social media. As we know, they are crucial for language learning and teaching, also for documentation, uh, for spreading and popularizing languages. At the same time, there are challenges related to access to digital technologies or their utilization. Would you like to reflect on uh, what is the situation with your language? Uh, how are these tools used and what are the challenges? And um, we can start again with uh, Grand Chief Ken Kikovicic. Well, mostly for the question, I think the one thing we realize about social media, it's very versatile. And um, often, you know, some of the connectivity challenges around data plans and that type of thing, um, people are very innovative at times when it comes to finding Wi-Fi. And uh, our people are quite creative actually at it. And I don't view it as much of a, as a challenge um, with, with those sorts of limitations. In fact, I think we really need to focus on harnessing social media and applications to be the new tool of, of educating our young people because that is um, what the future holds and perhaps some interactive um, uh, learning, um, virtual reality, uh, those types of things, those are some of the things we need to incorporate into the future. So it's, it's very powerful. I, I just think we're just, you know, uh, skimming the surface in terms of the opportunities with some of the applications, but we are seeing some pockets of success with things like Facebook groups and that type of thing for sharing the language. Thank you. Masiya, um, <clears throat> Sophia. Um, first of all, I just want to capture a couple of things and then I'll get into uh, technology. Uh, obviously, um, uh, equ equ equitable funding policy for indigenous languages needs to be comparable to French language funding all across the board. And uh, we are losing our language rapidly. And I can speak to um, the, my friend here, Guchen languages when I was in the Legislative Assembly, it was um, declining rapidly. The biggest barrier to language revitalization, of course, is a lack of resources. And Ken and, Ken and I are at the table with the fiscal policy with, at the federal level, 25 self-governing nations, and addressing this particular uh, language uh, as a model that we need to push forward to have a language revitalization, revitalization based on the best practices of what it takes to revitalize our languages uh, in our jurisdiction. Uh, within our jurisdiction of the uh, Clinchon uh, government, Clinchon nation, we have uh, uh, various apps. Uh, one of them is uh, our language app. And there's been a past version of language uh, uh, Yati app, uh, but we are making our own uh, just recently and thinking through a learner's perspective, what kind of phrases and words that should be conducted on and then learn on these, de these devices. And we are also working on cartoons and uh, have started a project to create a Clinchon Yati animated TV show for our children. As, as you know, a lot of our children, even my grand grandkids, they always hold up uh, devices every opportunity. So this is the best tool that we want to deliver in our language. Keyboard app is another one that have uh, um, first voices that allows to, to for, excuse me, for you to add indigenous language keyboards to your phone. And uh, some of the texting 
on a regular basis in our languages. So those are just some of the new uh, technology that uh, we're faced with. Social media is, uh, is a big ticket item and how we can relate our language uh, with various uh, social media. And those are some of the areas that uh, we're continuing to address. And um, obviously uh, we, we need to learn from our young people. And uh, they have innovative ideas, very creative, understand technology even more than we do sitting around here. And uh, they can help us do new and exciting things with a new uh, modern technology. So we're looking forward to positive changes coming. Merci. Merci. Yeah, um, for us, what I have noticed traveling the world is that in Greenland, we have some of the best internet connection in the world. We uh, can watch YouTube and go on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and almost anywhere, even in the small villages, except if you move further away from the capital, of course, and it's extremely expensive, despite the fact that we're all supposed to have equal access to this. Um, so we, of course, still have the problem of urbanization in Greenland as well, even on a digital level. Um, we have 99% uh, of our population that is over 13 years old and are able to have access to Facebook, have a Facebook account. So Facebook is extremely popular in the way that we communicate in Greenland. Uh, but that's where all our parents are. So we, of course, use Instagram and then the even younger ones are on TikTok. So these uh, uh, apps are being used in a very innovative way of sharing knowledge and uh, experience to the rest of the world. And we also had a few years ago this big uh, conundrum of what to do with all of these children who speak English fluently and who speak Korean fluently and who speak Spanish fluently because they watch YouTube videos all the time. Will they lose their language? But uh, from what I have gathered, we just have polylinguists now in Greenland, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, but unfortunately, the effect of this uh, polylinguism at this moment is that they are um, not masters of all of these languages. They are not very good at it. And when they have to write, when they have to read, suddenly they're not uh, that uh, strong when it comes to any language, Greenlandic or otherwise. But of course, Greenlandic is already really, really annoying to read for even us who speak Greenlandic fluently because it's so long. Uh, we put words together until it's a sentence. And that makes sense for us when we speak it. But when we write it down, we just look at it and go like, oh, okay. <laughs> so that is a problem we have. Uh, and that's why podcasts are becoming more and more popular in Greenland. So that is one of the uh, ways that we also try to to educate people by making podcasts to different ages, to different levels of education as well, to reach the people in a manner that is culturally appropriate as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Crystal? Um, <clears throat> I know in Arctic Village we have Starlink. <laughs> so. Everyone has internet access, um, and we tend to uh, do a lot on Facebook and Instagram, um, and it's funny that our iPhones start spell-checking our Gwich'in now. Um, the nerve, huh? <laughs> and then um, Gwich'in people, like, we like to tell stories, and we like to make people laugh. So we tend to do that even on social media. Uh, we, do, we post pictures and um, I noticed a lot of people start writing in Gwich'in and then translating it. Um, and that's how we like to share what we're doing in, in our culture and in our everyday life. Um, and we also have um, Molly of Denali on PBS. Um, it's a cartoon animation. Uh, sometimes they do full episodes in Gwich'in. Um, so those are just some of the things that we do. Um, there are apps. I, there's a couple of apps, I think, in Gwich'in, too. Um, but yeah, I think everyone is finding 
they're finding a way to learn the language and it's pretty neat. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, Grand Chief Lafferty mentioned earlier that we need to engage our younger generation to inspire them to learn our language. While we are still in early days of using social media and technology, we are digitizing stories shared over the radio starting in the 60s and determining uh, the best way that that can be shared with our participants. And we continue to add content to our Kaikit language app to make language learning more accessible. Thank you, Michelle. And I would like to, uh, we are really well into the lunch break now, but uh, I, I, as a moderator, I take the responsibility for appropriating informal way of treating the time. Um, nevertheless, I still would like to give the opportunity to our panelists for their closing short remarks of ideally <laughs> one to three sentences, <laughs> starting with Michelle. <laughs> uh, just merci for being here today. Thank you. <laughs> merci. You know, we like to tell stories. Right? <laughs> uh, I think sometimes it's best to, to just learn your, your language. Um, go visit grandma and grandpa, go to the fish cache, go don't wait for a $1,500 class. Don't wait for a grant. Just do it. Like, and to try every single day, even if you're not good at it. Merci. Thank you for the powerful message. Yeah, I can only echo that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to add, um, it's always been our elders and our ancestors' vision is uh, sharing. So sharing best practices. So learning from my, my buddy here, Kenny, and vice versa. I think we can go a long way, collaboration, working together. Uh, we can uh, showcase the world that um, we can do greater things as well. Masi. Masi, for that, all I add to all of that is uh, similar to what Crystal had mentioned, is not to be afraid of failure when it comes to learning your language. Embrace it because that is how you learn, by doing it, and then having people pick it apart, and then you get better by doing that. Similar to politics, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, dear panelists. Thank you all who joined us. And just a quick reminder for those who are interested to hear more from the panelists today, or uh, about the indigenous languages topics. There are two panels on Saturday, one organized by the Greenwich International, Greenwich International Council, moving forward in language and knowledge preservation and revitalization from 5 o'clock p.m. and another one at 11 on Saturday, digital environments and indigenous languages in the Arctic. Please be invited and thank you once again.